Okay. First of all, mm -hmm. I would like to thank the Vegetarian Health Society. I forgot one thing to introduce you, sub subject matter which you're going to speak on today. And the subject matter is intellectual knowledge is power and its limitation. Now, Ishwa was just, uh, I think when, the time we picked him up from the uh, airport, he didn't even know what he was going to speak on. And so, Ishwa, you will speak on intellectual knowledge is power and its limitation, <laughs> if you don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I am very grateful to Mr. Price and the Vegetarian Health Society for making it possible for me to come and hear and meet old friends here. I find many old friends are here in this audience and I can recognize them. Uh, it is true that these subjects uh, in the series of talks that they have prepared for me were not known to me till I arrived here. And after coming to the Chicago O'Hare Airport, uh, they obtained my consent to speak on these subjects. And I said, yes, these look like very good subjects. I think in uh, preparing the list of subjects on which I should speak here, they have shown that they understand what people would like to discuss and consider in the present situation that prevails around us. In other words, these subjects are quite pertinent and quite relevant in today's context and they need not apply only to life in the United States or Canada. They are equally relevant to life anywhere else, including life in India. So I am very happy at the selection of subjects they have made. Of course, I must confess at the outset that I am not a very qualified person to speak on these subjects. And I do not know much about these subjects. Much of what I, I will say may be secondhand knowledge. And some of it may be knowledge which uh, may be not up to the level of knowledge that you already possess. And therefore, maybe you could help me supplement my knowledge by appropriate comments and uh, questions and suggestions at the end of the talk. For today, the subject set, as just announced, is intellectual knowledge, its power, and its limitation. It's a very important subject. According to me, it's one of the most important subjects that we could have chosen for a day like this. The reason why I say so is that we are all trying to solve all problems intellectually. And we are somehow convinced that the intellect is the best source of knowledge, awareness, and the capability to resolve problems. This belief itself is erroneous, and therefore the subject is important. Now, I would like to, first of all, take you through a small structure of human awareness and consciousness to indicate to you where, according to me, intellect can be placed in that structure. I am not trying to create a new structure. I am just trying to paint a picture, draw an image before you so that you understand the language I speak. Because in these subjects, very often there is lack of communication because we use words which we mean quite differently. We don't have the same connotation for words. And therefore, it is useful at the outset to understand what we are talking about. As I understand it, human awareness, or the capacity to be aware, consists of five broad levels. The lowest level is what I might call the physical level, and arises from the physical body. We have given a name to ourselves, and we call ourselves by our names. He calls me Ishwapuri. He says, is Ishwapuri going to talk to you? The correct statement would be, this guy is going to talk to you whose body is called Ishwapuri. Because if there is any other capability for awareness besides the body, that has not been named Ishwapuri. Only this body after birth was so named. And if I keep on thinking I am Ishwapuri and not my body is Ishwapuri, I am identifying myself with that which is not me. What is mine could not be me, by simple understanding of this statement. When I say this is my jacket, it could not be me. So if I say this is my body, my body could not be me. It is my body. I own it, I possess it, I use it, but it could not be me. In the same way, when I say these are my eyes, it does not mean I am the eyes. When I say this is my mind, my mind does not agree, I could not be my mind. 
So we are using terms with which we are identifying ourselves. Though it does not take very long to find out that we are not those things which we are using. So this body which we use is the first level of knowledge, awareness, contact with experience. With this body, we create a relationship with the entire world. Father, son, mother, brother, children, friends, boss, job. These are relationships from the body. If we don't have the body, these relationships don't exist. The father is not my father, he is my body's father. The mother is not my mother, she is my body's mother. She gave birth to this body. Therefore, when we talk of the lowest level of awareness, we are talking of the awareness arising from this body. The bodily awareness, which we consider very important, is in fact the lowest. Next above that would be the awareness through the sensory perception and senses. The perception arising from senses is also being ascribed to the body while we are using the body. For instance, I say I can see because I have eyes in the physical body. But even when I close my eyes, I can see plenty of things. Imaginatively, I can see my home. I can see my friends. I can see what I was doing this morning. I can even visualize and see what I will be doing tomorrow. You might say that is imagination. I am not talking of imagination. I am talking of seeing. Vision. The capacity to have sight. That capacity to have vision and sight is not related to these physical eyes. And yet we always say, we can see because we have eyes. In fact, the truth is that we can see less because we have eyes. We only see what comes in front of the eyes. Therefore, the eyes do not help us to see. The eyes limit what we can see. And the rest we reject. Being at the physical level, the rest we say is not seeing at all. That is imagination. Similarly, hearing. We listen with these ears, but we can listen without the ears. In fact, we are listening without the ears all the time. We are listening to our thoughts. How do we know what we are thinking? We listen to our thoughts. These ears don't listen to those thoughts. And is the quality of listening or the very experience of listening any different from the experience of listening with these ears? It is not. Therefore, the capacity to listen hear is independent of these ears. So is it true of all other sense perceptions. All sense perceptions exist per se on their own and we attribute those perceptions to the body, which is an error. In fact, if we were unconscious of the body, we would still have all the sense perceptions and if we used our sense perceptions by themselves without the body, that would be called the next higher level of awareness. We sometimes refer to that as the astral level of awareness. Above that is the mental level, what we might call the causal level. We find that it is not even necessary to break up an experience into different sense perceptions to be able to have the experience. Today we are under an illusion that unless we see with the eyes, hear with the ears, touch with the hand, smell with the nose, unless we do all these things with senses, we can't have experience. But we know that the mind can pick up the experience without having to break it up into these functional compartments. In fact, some experiences are such which do not lend themselves to subdivision into senses. For instance, an abstract experience of idealism. We talk of idealism, we understand. The experience of idealism comes to us. It can neither be seen, nor heard, nor touched. It is not something that will be capable of being experienced through the senses. It is being experienced directly through the mind. If you contemplate a little further, you will find that all experience can be directly grasped by the human mind and need not be broken up. But since we have been accustomed to getting experience by breaking it up into pieces through senses, therefore we think that it is the senses that give us experience. When you can have experience mentally without having to use the body or the sense perceptions, we call it the mental experience, the causal experience. We call it the causal experience because it is the cause of all other experience. I'll come to that a little later. The fourth stage in the level of awareness is where we need not 
experienced through the mind. There is one special characteristic of all experience of the mind and therefore all experiences below it, including the experience of senses and the physical experiences, that they all need time, space and observe the laws of causation. Every experience that comes to us through this body or through the senses or through the mind needs time, space and causation. Even the smallest experience will be subject to these three laws. Let us see what the mind does. The mind has three parts. This is a classification only for understanding the subject. Don't take it very seriously that actually there are three minds or something. I'm just using this analysis to build up the structure of levels of awareness. The mind has a lower part which picks up the elements of sense perception through the senses. It is doing nothing but absorbing what is coming up. Now, when I say it's absorbing what is coming up, Please remember that frames of experience that come from senses by themselves have no meaning unless the mind interprets them. It's very strange if you are merely shown these pictures of what the eyes see, the few flashes of what the eyes see, the few sounds that the ears hear, the phonetic sounds, and the few other sensory experiences that we have, it will make no sense at all. It's the lower part of the mind that picks up these pictures, puts them together and gives a meaning to it. That's the lower aspect of the human mind. The middle mind is the one that does what is called reasoning, logic, argument, inferencing. It is a thinking mind. This part of the mind is functioning all the time while we are alive, day and night, whether we are awake or asleep. Thinking is the pumping in of words in the middle of the mind. A stream of words is going through the mind at all times. And this function of the mind is called the thinking part. And this is a continuous process. The upper part of the mind does what we call creation, creativity. The creative mind is the one that is rearranging the elements of sense perception, sometimes with, sometimes without the assistance of the thoughts into new patterns and putting them out. And we say, what beautiful creativity we have, we possess. It is nothing that is created except the pattern. The design is new, but the elements of creation are the same which the mind has picked up. Now the point I am making is that all these three functions of the human mind, sensing, thinking and creating, need time, space and they obey the laws of causation. But the next higher level of awareness, which we in the Orient call <clears throat> the awareness of the soul, spiritual awareness, transcends these limitations of time, space and causation. In the West I find there are very few people who will distinguish between the human mind and the human soul. Very often they regard the two terms as synonymous. In fact, the difference qualitatively is so great there is no overlap between the two. Because the mind, as I have explained, functions only in time, space and causation. The soul only outside time, space and causation. There is nothing common between them. The soul of a human being, of every individual human being, has the capacity to have experience which has no time, space or causation. And I'll give you a few examples. There are three main functions which the human soul performs. The first is spiritual intuition. The intuitive spirit in us which gives us a sudden flash, a hunch of knowledge, does not take any time and does not occur in space. It has no cause. It wasn't there and now it is suddenly there. Very often it is quite inconsistent with what the mind has been reasoning. The mind says it should happen like this. Suddenly one fine morning an intuitive flash comes which is quite inconsistent with what the mind has said. That intuitive flash does not at all belong to the realm of time, space or causation. The second function is love. When we have the experience of love, that great experience which makes us lose our own identity and takes our entire awareness into, into the one whom we love, that experience of love does not occur in time, space and causation. It wasn't there and it is there. 
When it is there, we think about it. How is it there? That thought is in space, time and causation. The contemplation of what has happened is certainly time, space and causation. Because that is the mind, thinking about what has happened. Very often the mind by thinking of what has happened destroys the love that is beyond time, space and causation. But the quality of love is such that it does not subject itself to the laws of time, space and causation. The third example would be of aesthetic experience, beauty. When you see beauty in something, the experience is identical with love. It does not subject itself to any laws of time, space and causation. These experiences of intuition, love and beauty are not arising from the mind at all. They are arising, arising from a higher level of awareness, which we consider as spiritual awareness, which is arising from the soul of man and not from the mind of man, which is arising from a deeper part of the human self. It is above the intellect, that part. Finally, there is the fifth level of awareness. What is lacking in the fourth level that I should try and describe a fifth level? That inadequacy in the fourth level is, it is still subject to the law of individuation. Even if you appreciate beauty, it's you individually appreciating beauty. Individual, separated from the rest. Even the experience of love is your experience of love of an individual. Even the intuition, the intuitive knowledge or awareness is an individual's intuitive knowledge. Individuation itself becomes a weakness of awareness, inadequacy of awareness, a cover upon awareness. The fifth level of awareness is when this cover is removed and we have what we might call total consciousness or the consciousness of totality. And the discovery is made that the entire picture of experience is drawn up by one author and he is the author of all. And there is no such thing as any wall between one individual and another. The highest level of awareness transcends individuation. I have briefly described these levels to tell you how we have the capacity to have awareness at different levels. It does not mean we are using different levels at different times. All are being used together at the same time. We have the physical body, the senses, the mind, the soul, totality, all together. The whole drama of life is going on with this entire complex of awareness put together. The intellect over which we take so much pride and so much pains is the third part, the mind. And in the mind also the middle part, the reason. The reasoning mind is what we call the intellect. All our educational process, our system of civilizing ourselves seems to be directed to sharpening the instruments and tools of intellect. We don't seem to do anything to the other levels of awareness. The result is that we grow up into a distorted form where we rely far more on the intellect than on any other form of awareness, including the intuitive form or the spiritual form. The great capacity for awareness which lies hidden in a human being through the availability of the intuitive power, the power of love and joy and beauty is destroyed by an excessive use of intellect. Now the intellect plays a very important role in understanding, drawing up a structure, analysis, there is no instrument better than the intellect. I have drawn this picture of the five levels of awareness in such a way it should appeal to your intellect. The fact that I made it into a structure and five levels immediately sold the idea to your intellect. Had I not broken it into five parts, you wouldn't have liked it. Because the intellect's method is to break. There is no other way in which the intellect can function except to break. Of course, euphemistically we call it analysis. Whereas the soul of man, a higher level of awareness, functions not by breaking but by joining. The appropriate word being synthesis. As against the analysis of the human mind, the soul is capable of synthesis. In synthesis we see the beauty of the whole. In analysis we understand the mechanics of the part but lose the beauty. There's a lovely painting on that side. You may like to turn and have a look. Now it looks pretty. You may like it or not like it. You may say it's not very good or good, but it has a certain beauty. Even one glance gives you the beauty. Just a temporary. You didn't even look at it for a second. Now I am going to take that picture, that painting there, 
and cut it into small strips and make one inch squares of it. And I'll place the heap of those squares here, here so that each one of you come and go over each one of the squares 20 times over at length. That means you will see it thoroughly. You'll never see that beauty which you saw in one second. You can go over those pieces all your life, you'll not see it. Because you have broken up the beauty. You can understand the mechanics. Every bit of color will come up. You'll know what color was used, how much was used. You can wait. You can give all the scientific analysis. You will have intellectualized that painting by cutting it into pieces. What are we doing to life? Life is a beautiful painting. And we are cutting it into parts of today's and tomorrow's, of here and there, of this one and that one. We are applying scissors of the intellect to chop off life into small pieces. And then we wonder where the beauty of life lies. If we could hold ourselves together and see life in its totality, the beauty would reappear. But that requires not the intellect, but the spirit of man, the soul of man, to look at it. The intellect can never see the totality. The intellect is the greatest barrier to seeing the totality. The intellect is the greatest barrier to our seeing our own self. The intellect makes us feel that we are the mind. The intellect says the shirt which I am wearing is me. The body I am wearing is me. The mind I am using is me. It is the intellect that is saying so. These absurdities are accepted as truths because we are relying on the intellect. These are the greatest limitations of the intellect. And yet I cannot condemn intellect so badly. Because if I did so, I would have no business to lecture here. I would have no capacity to communicate with you. Therefore, up to a point, intellect is our only instrument. But if we say that we'll go all the way along through intellect, we are making a mistake. I am suggesting that there should be a reasonable balance between the use of intellect and the use of the higher faculties of human awareness. And let not intellect come in the way of the use of the higher faculties. The best contribution that intellect can make to human awareness is to say, I can go this further and no more. It's a great contribution. And nothing else in human awareness can perform that function except intellect. It's a great power to be able to understand that you can understand this much and no more. If we have a look at our own intellect and find out how it functions, we will be left in no doubt that anything that is beyond space, time and causation is beyond intellect. It doesn't take a minute. You talk of a concept which is beyond time. Let us take the concept of timelessness. The intellect shuts itself up. It is unable to do anything to it. Let us talk of the beginning before the beginning. The intellect shuts itself up. The moment you cut off any experience from its time sequence, the intellect cannot go further. But the problem is that the intellect does not perform this function unless we sharpen the intellect to that extent. That means even for the intellect to say, this is my limitation, requires a developed intellect. Therefore, I am not condemning intellect. I am suggesting let us develop intellect in order to discover its own limitation. When it discovers its limitation, we will be able to go beyond the intellect. The intellectual limitation keeps us at a level at which we cannot see truth. Day in and day out we hear that God, the creator, is love. We hear of his beauty and joy. And we hear of the great intuitive powers that people possess. If the intellect alone were to be used to discover these truths, it will never do so. That is why we don't do so. The greatest power of the intellect is to discover its own limitation. That it cannot transcend anything that is not in time, space and causation. And having said so, the intellect then can be persuaded to step aside, to let the rest of human awareness function. It is not necessary to demolish the intellect. The human mind, which principally consists of the intellectual prowess of a human being, does not have to be destroyed. I find people interested in higher levels of awareness, trying to beat their minds and saying, oh, this mind is the cause of all this trouble. I find it is very easy for us, and I will tell you soon who this us is. It is very easy for us to find a scapegoat for all our problems. That us is the mind itself. The mind says, oh, this mind is terrible. We must beat it out of existence. Who says the mind is terrible? The mind is our enemy. 
The mind is coming in the way. Who is saying so? The mind. It's a thought. The very thinking process which is the main function of the mind is saying, kill this mind. Oh, you will reach everywhere. The highest levels can be attained by killing the mind. Who is saying so? The mind. What are we trying to do? We are trying to push out a dog who has entered our meeting and we don't want him here by beating him with his own tail. And we don't let go of his tail because we have to beat him with it. How will he go out? We are holding on to the same dog. We are trying to use the same mind to beat the mind with. And we think we are doing a great job in order to reach higher levels of awareness. It is not necessary to beat the mind. It is necessary to understand that the mind has its limitations. If somebody were to say, in India, people are very lucky. They don't have developed minds. They go straight to heaven. Because they don't think. They only have intuition. They go straight up. It is not true. Just because you can sentimentally, emotionally, follow a guru or a master and blindly go after him does not mean you have gone anywhere. In fact, people who have gone with blind faith have had their faith shaken as quickly as it has been built. On the other hand, people who have gone through the more arduous and tortuous process of going through the intellect, reaching its limitation, understanding that it can't go any further, have had their faith founded on a very solid basis. It's not been shaken. The Indian philosophers have said that if you want to have real faith, you must deal with the problems that the intellect raises. Do not evade them. You must find answers to the questions which the intellect is putting before you. If you brush them aside, you will never have faith. Because from a corner they will go on attacking your faith. So many questions come to us, our intellect is not satisfied. And we say, oh, this is not an intellectual process. Let's keep it aside, these questions aside, and we'll go straight to higher levels of awareness. It doesn't happen. Because when we want to go, the question still comes from the side. We should face the question squarely, find the answers to satisfy the intellect and take the level of the intellect to a point where the intellect will say, I can go this further and no more. Then alone the intellect will step aside and allow us to use the higher levels of awareness of intuition and the human soul. Therefore, it has been said that the human mind is the greatest enemy of man. And yet, when fully developed, and made to perform its full function of discovering its own limitation is the best friend of man. In the spiritual development of man towards higher awareness, the human mind has been the greatest obstruction. And when it has understood its obstructive role, it has been the greatest help. The mind and the intellect, when it plays a subtle game with us of making us believe that we are the intellect and not anything other than the intellect, or making us believe that it is helping us in overcoming the intellect, is the most subtle enemy of our progress. But the same mind, when it realizes that we are not going to be taken in by these subtle tricks, becomes the best friend of man in the spiritual journey. It's a remarkable thing. Now the point to remember is the mind does not have its own consciousness. It is not that there are two beings in a human body. There is only one being. Consciousness is being derived only from the human soul. The mind has no consciousness of its own. The mind is just a cover. It is thriving on the consciousness. It is borrowing from the soul. And therefore, it creates illusions which make us believe that we are the mind. How many of us have had a chance to observe the mind? I sometimes marvel at the situation in which we live, in which we are so preoccupied with the experience around us that we have no time to look at the one who is having the experience. It's most irrational. Even the intellect should reject it. But we are all doing it. From birth till now, let us have a look how much of our time we spent with the experience and how much of the time with the experiencer. Hardly any time with the experiencer. One yogi in India told me a very nice story once. He said there was once upon a time a king who had a great army because the king was as big as his army in those days. But there was no war. The neighboring kings were peaceful. So he had a hard time to satisfy himself that he was a big king. Because his army was not fighting any battles. So he decided to set up mock battles within his kingdom in order to have the feel that he is a great king. But then if there were mock battles, there would be no fun. The battles should be made to look real. 
and if battles take place in the presence of all the people they will say what are you doing king and they'll stop it like people are trying to stop many present day rulers also trying to do the same thing therefore he decided to build a big fortress a big wall high wall all around and inside that he constructed an artificial area where he could array in the forces he created the enemy forces and his own forces they were all employed by him and they engaged in mock battles which looked like real battles he created the oceans and great waters he put battleships there he created new townships he created a complete kingdom within his kingdom and all around that kingdom he built a big wall of course he left some chinks some little slits in that wall now the people who were outside they were so interested in watching what is going on they stuck on to those chinks and they would peep inside and see what's going on what was going on was not real but they liked it so much they thought it was real and if another person wanted to move them to take a turn they wouldn't get away if his friends and relatives said come along you have had enough of it they would say no hold on i can't leave it they spent their entire life putting their eyes on the chinks and looking at the mock battles that were taking place inside when the yogi told me the story he said do you realize this is what we are doing these are the chinks of the mock battle outside we have glued ourselves to these chinks we are looking out through these chinks of our eyes and our sense perception we have no time to look at ourselves we have no time to hear hear any voice inside us we have no time to heed any call that comes from within we have no time to see what is behind these chinks behind the eyes this is our situation and it looks funny that we should be so stuck with what is happening outside that we shouldn't be able to turn around to see who is so stuck at least we should see who is stuck to this experience not even for a moment and some people read good books intellectual the books say you should get everything from within because the books say the same thing which the yogi said which everybody says so we read more books outside and the books say if you want to see what is behind the eyes you must find somebody who has seen behind the eyes so we go all out to find the person outside who has seen behind the eyes and the book says you must worship the lord who is inside you so we go outside to a church or temple to worship the lord who is inside us at no stage after reading the books hearing lectures hearing the preachers and thinking about it with all the intellectual comprehension that they all saying go within we all go without for the same purpose and this is the intellect upon which we rely so much it is this quality of the intellect to keep us out that creates the problems this very human mind when it begins to pull us back is equally passionate and strong to pull us back the human mind has one immediate failing it is fond of pleasure that is so immediate that it is noticeable by all and this weakness is a weakness as well as a strength because the pleasures that we see in the mock world around are holding us there but fortunately for us there are pleasures in the real world within and once we turn it it will not like to come out so the very weakness of the human mind to seek pleasure becomes the strength of the human mind when it turns to that direction main thing is can we turn the direction of the mind can intellectual flow which is seeking all answers from outside be switched over to seek the answers inside if this can be done the same intellect becomes the strongest power and help for a human being what is making the intellect go out there is a small part of the intellect which i shall deal with more extensively in another lecture the title set for that which is called attention it's the human attention that takes the intellect out the experience around us whether sensory bodily mental or any other experience all experiences around us seem to be a fixed experience over which we have no control we seem to have a control over which of the experience to attend to and which one not to attend to it seems we can pick up some experience through our attention it's a great capability it's one of the greatest gifts that god could have given to man to provide him the instrument of attention by which he can pick up part of the experience and leave the rest he can be here and not there this capacity to be here and not there is the capacity which enables man 
to be there and not here. The capacity to switch over the human consciousness and the mental flow outside within comes from the use of attention. The only part of human awareness which can be manipulated, which is within our control. Through the use, effective use of the attentive mechanism, the mechanism of attention, we can change the direction of the flow of intellect from within outside to outside within. When that happens, we discover the reality of our own self. And the same intellect, being guided by the pleasures that lie within, then takes us very fast within. In one of my earlier days of discipleship of a great master, I used to question why he always said that there are great pleasures and joys within. And I said that many yogis and holy men in our country have been saying that pleasure is the basis of sin, is the basis of our continuous birth and rebirth, is the basis of all the ills we have. And you are saying there are great pleasures inside. Are you not bribing the human mind to go in? Is it not a bait which is not very ethical? And every time you say, take the mind inside because there are a lot of pleasures inside. And the great master used to say, that's the only way the mind will go in. <laughs> There's no other way. It is a bait, but it is the only bait that works. And since those tremendous pleasures and joys are there, which are joys for the mind, for the intellect, therefore we are willing to turn. The only point is we don't believe that they are there. There is a dark period, a little blank period of switching over from here to there. That little period, which is a very small period, but a very critical period. When we are not sure if they are there, so we are not sure of leaving these. If we don't leave these, we don't go there. When we are not sure they are there, we stay here. Then we say we want to go there. When we want to turn, we don't leave these for taking us to higher levels of awareness. Thus, I would say the intellect of the human mind has the greatest potential for helping us as well as the greatest potential for obstructing us from realizing ourselves. I have made these statements. I will be very happy to answer any questions or listen to any comments on what I have said. Thank you. That process of changing from the fun on the outside to go to the inside, does one have to completely give up the outside 100% or is it that he gives up part of that and gets part inside? He gives up 50% out, he gets 50%, he gives up 75% out, he gives it. Is it a proportional thing or does he give up 100% out and then start to get the inside? I have been trying to use this telephone call uh, overseas calls uh, and I find it goes through the satellite and the words bounce from the satellite and I have noticed that there is a little time lag if you notice carefully a slight time lag between uh, your, your speaking of the words and they are being reached there and they are bouncing back very small time lag if you are very careful you can notice when we have been communicating with the spaceships there has been a longer time lag you probably know that when we send instructions to one of the probes going to another planet, uh, we would send a message. Through space, it would take several minutes. So although the instruction would be responded to immediately, we would hear it after half an hour. Time lag is there. In the same way, in switching over from here to there, there is a time lag. Small area of a gap. If it was a straight line and we gave 50% up here and 50% came there, it would be easy. We would all transfer ourselves. We just make short ins installments, give up these pleasures here, we go on getting equal pleasures there, fine. What is happening is you give up some pleasures there, there is time lag to get the pleasures there. In those time lag, we come back to those pleasures here. There is a definite grey part in this transition from the pleasures outside to the pleasures inside and that is where many of us get blocked. It is said that there are only two major areas where we really get blocked in a spiritual journey. There is the first major area. The second comes at the level when we want to change from individuation to total, final stage. So, there are two major areas which are called dark areas. And this first one is sometimes referred to as the need to put in human effort. Otherwise, they say an enlightened man should be able to do this switching immediately. He can do it. But a man of enlightenment, a mystic, a master, although he can do it immediately, he leaves this to create the concept of human effort. And he says, look, I am going to take you on a beautiful journey. 
It's a lovely trip we are going to make. I'll give you the time schedule of the train to read. And you'll see from the, as soon as we board the train, from there, every station stop will show us new sights, lovely things. I'll buy you the ticket. I'll go with you. I'll be there at the station. But you come to the station yourself. And just because we are not sure if he'll be there at the station, we don't go. That portion from our home to the station, we are not willing to go. That's the dark portion. Therefore, although theoretically it is true that you need not give up everything here to get everything there. You give partly here, you will get partly there. But when you give up partly here, there's a time lag before you get partly there. If you're willing to wait and not get back again into the partly here, you'll get it. Yes. I have to say something. Uh, the pleasure of pain, pain theory, theory. Uh, man, uh, or his, what he calls man, the thinking mind, seems to constantly be in uh, apprehension, troubles, and so on. And that motivates the individual constantly to either to become better or to raise his consciousness, whatever you want to put it, or go back. He can go either way. And if he uh, puts his attention here, he will go back. So he must, if he ever tastes a little bit of good, uh, he goes that way. But in that good, I think you call it dialectical or some word, uh, a movement up, that the negative becomes positive and all the way up. So, um, then uh, when a man says that my name is Charan Singh, he is not Charan Singh, but he is, has that same attribute within him then he is like uh, J.C. said, I am the father of one. So that although this may seem strange, you lose identity of coloration or uh, form. Because this is all, this whole thing is a billion, million, trillion so-called spirits that are flying around. There's a little karma, I've batted them away a little bit. But I, I just have to say that I understand, but it's very difficult for me to talk to sometimes to people because I become frustrated with not being able to say or communicate. It's not that I'm mad at some particular person. I get mad at myself sometimes, but uh, there's a limit too to how much you say go with that and you'll have it. Yes, but how much? How much can you do? And, uh, you know, I mean, I show you can love it, but there's the irresponsible responsibilities that you have to uh, apparently cope with. You have to work. You have to be with people. You owe them uh, destiny, karma, fate, like, you know, so forth. Now, I don't know if I made a question, but it's... Uh, you made a beautiful comment. Well, The best part I, of your comment, which I liked, is the one where you are referred to the pain-pleasure relationship. Because I was talking of pleasures, you have clarified that there can be no pleasure unless there is pain. Which is correct. No, there, can there, be there cannot be any concept of pleasure unless there is pain. It's all pairs of opposites. Therefore, when we talk of any inducement, if I want to say, you will have pleasure there, you must have some experience of pain to figure out that there is something opposite to that which you are seeking. That is why all experiences are in pairs of opposites. Including, including the experience of not being able to communicate adequately. Then you feel that you will be able to communicate that. This is, this is uh, uh, like you. You mentioned Harvard. I can say Erickson. He wrote a book on, uh, on uh, what's the guy's name? Martin Luther. He's an analyst, apparently, not a psychiatrist. So that myself, I had, I, when I met the man, that it was there. It's within the soul. This is what I'm trying to grasp. It's within the soul. All that knowledge, all that whatever, the, it's there, but the mind takes that and twists a little bit and changes the metrics, the mold, and you get a different version, but, so that's, I just, so I can't say no more, but that's it. Thank you for the comment. Yes. Uh, the world seems to be struggling with this limit of, limits of the intellect. Uh, in, the, in the scientific world, you see this a lot. Uh, I'm interested in, in brain research, and it seems that there's two positions. There are those, those scientists who study the brain who, said, who say that everything that human beings do, and that covered the gamut from, you know, brushing their teeth to mystical experiences, can all be explained sooner or later through the activity of the, the brain cells, 10 billion brain cells. 
There's another group of scientists studying the brain who are equally qualified, and you know, who say that in all their years of study, they, they now come to realize that the human mind, the experiences of the human mind, cannot be explained just by what's going on in the brain. And it, it seems that uh, both these sides kind of go back and forth. One wants to cling to a materialism. The other is the others saying we can't go any farther than this. And, I, and people seem to want to do this. It seems like science has got this, it's got, in one way they're very conservative, and the other way they're very uh, mystical. If you study, if you look at Einstein and these, and these brain people, and, and uh, you say, my God, you know, we are indeed miracles. And all, why don't people just, you know, read a book on anatomy and it, you know, it's enough. But yet the other people seem to want to say, it's just all some kind of, uh, magic, just some kind of creation. It's illogical what they, what they're trying to say. That in itself seems to be kind of a, a block. The two people can study exactly the same subject matter. And one has a mystical view of it, and the other has, you know, a common view of it. I wonder what, uh, and again, you see that in the whole in the world all around us. You know, the people that say, "Well, let's tear this down and get all the energy out of it, so we can run our cars for ten more years." And other people saying, "We have to stop doing that and start sitting in the trees a little more and, and meditating on it." How do you see that that process working out? You know, in, I think it's a good question. It's a good question you have asked, and uh, there's a very good, a better question hidden in the question you have asked. You have said that the 10 billion or 10 billion or 20 billion brain cells, I'm not sure of the number, there are different people saying yeah. different number, that these cells are responsible for the functioning of the brain as revealed in the experience of consciousness. The others say that when consciousness functions, the 12 billion cells get activated. Okay, this is, maybe everybody doesn't understand that one, so I'll put it in another form. I am having a look at this piece of paper and just seeing this piece of paper before me. How do I see this paper? The conventional scientist of yesterday, he said, you see the paper because there is light. If the light is put off, you won't see the paper. And the light that is there, that light falls on it and gets reflected from the paper and travels in near parallel lines towards your eyes. And in the eyes, you have the lens which focuses this on your retina. The retina has those rods and cones of the optic nerve, which carries the message to the brain. In the brain, the message is transferred to the appropriate center in the gray matter. And in that appropriate center, consciousness picks it up. Which means if you are not conscious, it won't pick it up. If I am sleeping, or I am given a drug, it's made unconscious, I may have my eyes open and the light may be on, the paper will be there, I won't see it. When I am conscious, consciousness picks up this experience. This is the conventional scientist's explanation of how I see the paper. Now, I have very often talked to these scientists and said that, do you know for certain the functioning of the retina of the eye? Do you know it can make its own pictures? They said, yes. This is very recent, incidentally. When a person sees hallucination, the retina has all the picture already. Other people are not seeing what he is seeing, but his retina is seeing. The rods and cones are making the pattern all right. If the retina has the power to make a picture and makes the picture of this paper, will I see the paper exactly as it is or in any other? Because the rest of the steps are the same. The optic there will convey to the brain, the brain will uh, send it to the center and the center consciousness will pick up. The moment the retina starts performing this function without the paper, I see the paper the same. Well, let's not give this quality to the retina. But imagine that in the brain cell, this power exists to make a paper when it wishes to, or when it is properly stimulated to make a paper. When it is triggered off to make a paper, it makes a paper in the brain. If it does, I will see the paper, just as I see now. Not only will I see the paper just as it is, the retina will also be having the paper, and this paper will be there. Then, supposing there is no power in the brain to make any paper, but consciousness which picks up the final message, it itself has the power to make the paper and see the paper. Then the brain will also have the paper, the optic nerve will have the paper, the retina will have the paper, and this paper will be there as I see it now. Question is, is the paper there and therefore the consciousness is making the paper? Or is consciousness making the paper, therefore the paper is there? Which is the causal direction? Which is the cause and which is the effect 
That's the question. So the scientists turn around to me and say, that is a very simple question to answer. Whichever comes first must be the cause. What comes later must be the effect. Cause effect relationship is in time. Therefore, if I take away the paper from you, you don't see it. When I put the paper before you, you see it. This is the cause and not what you are seeing. And I tell them, that's very good. This has one little fallacy, of course. The fallacy is that the one who is taking up the paper is also in the same level of consciousness as the paper. If I can create a paper from consciousness, I can also create the guy who is taking away the paper. To, to illustrate the point, supposing I am having a dream and in the dream I see this paper. Now, we know when we wake up that this paper wasn't there. The mind made the paper. So it was clearly projected from the mind onto the table in the dream. Of that there is no doubt. Because we have woken up. That's how we know. Supposing we haven't woken up and in the dream I see this paper and suddenly the thought comes to me, this is not a real paper, it's a dream paper. I am having a dream. Somebody standing there in the dream says, no, no, it's a real paper. I can pick it up, you won't see it. So he comes and takes the paper, he says, how can it be a dream? And I say, fine, you proved it is not a dream. And when I wake up, I find this paper and the guy who picked up the paper were both exactly the same part of the dream. So long as two experiences belong to the same level of awareness, one cannot be used to prove the other. If I can, through my consciousness, create a paper, I'll surely create the entire creation around me, the entire experience at that level. Therefore, no part of that experience can be used as a proof of the causal direction of what is causing what. Now, here, the scientists are running into this difficulty. They know that the two things are happening together. That when you have a certain conscious phenomena, the brain cells also do this. What is first and what is second cannot be answered. There is one answer. One way to answer that question. The same way in which you can say whether it was a dream or not, to awake. Because there is no doubt left when I wake up. Supposing I saw this paper in the dream last night. And this morning when I woke up, all of you came to me and said, look, that paper was not a dream, it was real. You know, I'll reject the testimony of all of you. I say, I know it personally. It was my dream. You can't disprove my dream. If I wake up, nobody can disprove my experience of awaking. The same way, if there is a method by which you can raise your level of awareness to the next higher wakeful level, not just expanded awareness in the same level, next higher wakeful level, you get the answer. Whether what you saw at the lower level was being created from consciousness or was real and was being fed into consciousness. Now these mystics who have done that, their experience is that the causal direction is clearly consciousness through the experience. Through consciousness alone we are creating everything. All that we are seeing and experiencing, whether sensory or otherwise, is being generated from consciousness. Consciousness alone has the capacity to experience and it creates an illusion to make it real in which we feel that the things are real. Now, many people would like to say, but if the world looks so real, it's, how can it be an illusion? Well, it is precisely because it's so real, it's a good illusion. If it didn't look so real, how would it be an illusion? There's another po uh, um, uh, important point to remember, that when we talk of illusion, we are not referring to the unreality of illusion. When I have a dream, the dream may not be real in the sense it is not what is here now, but it's a real dream. People talking of illusion or having read some books, they reject the whole thing, it doesn't exist. Of course it exists as a dream. There is a nice story I'll tell you about one of our yogis in India, one called Shankar, lived near Bombay. It's a nice story, but take it as a story, it's not uh, supposed to be real. It illustrates a point. Shankar was walking with his disciples in a street in which a magician lived. A magician by definition is one who creates an illusion. Illusion is that which is not real. In reality there is something else, he makes it appear something else, that is illusion. That magician by illusion made a piece of string, a little rope, look like a snake and function like a snake. He threw that piece of string on the street and it looked like a snake. When Shankar and his disciples reached that point, Shankar asked his disciples, what is that lying on the road? And most of them said, that's a snake. Then one who had done his homework better, 
He stepped forward and he said, no sir, this is an illusion. In fact, it is just a piece of string. It looks like a snake, it's behaving like a snake, but that's an illusion. The reality is, it's a piece of string. Shankar said, are you sure? He said, absolutely sure, you taught me this business. I'm sure. <laughs> he said, if you are sure that this is a piece of string, why don't you go and pick it up? So the disciple steps forward and he picks up the snake and the snake coils around him and ultimately bites him in the arm. And he says, ouch. Then Shankar asked him, now tell me, in reality, is it a snake or is it a piece of string? And groaning with pain, the disciple says, sir, in reality, it is a piece of string. He says, tell me, is the string real or is your ouch real? He says, both are real. Now, the point I am illustrating is, it is not necessary to have real things to have real experience. You can have real experience with unreal things. And that's precisely what is happening. If in a dream, a person attacks you with a knife and inflicts pain on you, the knife is not real, but the pain is. The pain, even in a dream, is real, but the knife is not real. What is happening here around us is, and that is called the grand illusion, Maya. We call it Maya, the grand illusion. The grand illusion is that from the experience of pain and pleasure, which is real, we are jumping to the conclusion that the things that cause them are real. The fact is the pain and pleasure is real, but the things are not real. They are illusion. And uh, this is being created because the causal direction is from consciousness to experience. Through our own consciousness, we create the entire experience. And the experience being real, we begin to think that the things placed in the experience are also real. And we are led into let, looking into the chinks only and not turning away. So we, we create this floor out of, our brain creates this floor out of the light bags. Yeah. It creates you out of, out of the lines in your face and it's all, none of this exists, it only exists as images in our, our brain. Same thing with the sound. Correct. You learn these sounds, you, over a period of time you just put them, it creates the image outward. If someone ran in here and just robbed a grocery store down the street, he would have a totally different creation of this scene, you sitting there talking to us, then we perceive it. Right. So then the trick is then to become subtle enough through some technique or other to begin to see the way out of this or to see the... the it's very simple. Why so complicated? Why complicated? Simple. The trick is, the technique is that instead of seeing at the things that are happening, turn around to see from where they're happening. That's all. That's what I've been suggesting. Just turn the direction of attention and you'll see. You'll see the cause directly. But we are so tied up with the effect, we never see the cause. If you ask me, all meditation is an attempt at turning the direction of attention. I want to say one thing. When Years ago, when I studied whatever, I don't know, science probably, we talked about you didn't see anything where there was no eye, you, there was nothing there, or it wasn't color at least, if there was no eye to see it. Now people see without eyes. Well, but they were talking Now they see physical. so much. They some see, some see with, yeah, physical. some see with much physical. I'm also talking physical. I know, but you're talking about something different. But when, when I studied science, no, no noise, if there was no ear to hear it, or no eye, if there was no, I mean, no uh, color or painting or whatever, if there was no eye to see it, you, it is, it, they said it wasn't there. Okay, I'll give you a very small experiment to conduct. What a moment. The experiment I would like you to conduct tonight, or tomorrow, or at your convenience is to get into a place where you can hear nothing for a few moments. Mm -hmm. Is there any such place? Mm -hmm. Has anybody sat in a place where he heard nothing? Try it. You may have thought that you have heard nothing. Because, no, no, no. You will see the immense sounds around you at all times. You will sit anywhere. Plenty inside. Try it. Try and sit somewhere, but you have to notice. That means, attentively, listen, is there any sound coming? If you didn't have an ear there, there wouldn't be one. But uh, you may have blocked your ears. That's what they used to say, I'm telling they you. They used to that's, say? Yeah, they used to yeah. say there was no sound if there was no ear to hear. And that, there was no color if there was no eye to see. But uh, the Indian mystics for the last several thousand years, since the Rig Veda was written, several thousand years they have been saying that the real hearing is having ears you hear. Uh, without ears you can hear, without eyes you can see. No, I was talking I, about something physical, uh, different. How is it different physical? No, when you say physical, I am also talking about physical sound. Actual thing there, 
Okay. What is the actual thing? I'm talking about spiritual and, and otherwise. Okay, you tell me. When you come from your home now, you were in Deerfield. Yes. Right? And in Deerfield, you were sitting in the sofa and there was a cat there, there was a dog there. You can see them? I couldn't with my eyes closed. Right now? If I didn't have any eyes, no, I No, with your eyes open or closed, can you see them now? No. No, they're not here. <laughs> <laughs> I know they're not here, but you can see them. If you could not, if you could not see them, you would not say they are not here. Do you know you could not say they are not here if you could not see them now? This statement one makes, they are not here after you have seen them, that they are there. They are there. You have seen them there. <laughs> Therefore, the quality of seeing, is this not physical? Have you gone to an astral level to see them? Have you gone somewhere else? All you are saying is, it's my, it's my memory, it's my imagination. But seeing is the same. Seeing is not different. Why did they teach us that, I wonder? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, please. Oh, there are a lot of uh, these uh, things coming up. Yes. What's the difference between attention and consciousness? The difference between consciousness and attention is that attention is a probe. A, a thing that can pull attention to one point. When you give attention to a thing, you draw consciousness to that thing. If you give attention to a subject, you draw consciousness to that subject. Consciousness is the total awareness. But when you draw awareness to a particular area of experience, it's called attention. So attention is the capacity to be conscious of something and not conscious of others. For example, if you hear music in an orchestra, the drum and the flute and a number of uh, piano and a lot of things playing and you want to hear the flute only. It sounds very good. You give your attention to the flute. The more attention you give, the drum becomes less audible. If you really have concentrated attention, you will not hear anything but the flute. This capacity to put consciousness only on one experience or a small area of experience is called attention. So if we want to uh, realize you know, that everything around us is an illusion, we have to take our consciousness and, and, uh, you can reverse reverse the flow of attention by using the same process of thinly siphoning your consciousness through attention on your own self. You see the illusion. Yes. Can you talk about the subject of merits? Uh, it appears that we have a quantitative amount of merits uh, that we're born with. Some have more or less merit, apparently. I've read stories of uh, in some of the different books that talk about people that have various pleasures, maybe from the vices of the world, they waste these merits, or they hurt people and they waste these merits, or they do other things and they get some of these merits back. How does this exchange take place? Why is it the pleasure? Is it? I guess it would be like opening the hole of the body somehow and letting all the pleasure or the merits go out when they would rush out through actions centrifugally from the body. Is, can you talk about that? But what you're really talking about is uh, the human ego. You heard of ego. I talked of intellect. I didn't touch upon ego. But the fact is that all these are related to the ego. The ego, individual human mind, wants to excel in relation to other human mind. Uh, you have heard of problems. Have you heard of the word problem? In this country, we hear very often. I have a problem. Yeah, okay. You heard that all the time? Yeah, okay. now, yeah. Moment, now moment. I want to suggest to you to have a look at this word problem and see if there's any problem except the problem of another human being. Is it true that if there was only one human being on this earth, there would be no problem? Problems are not being created by anything else, but they're social problems, problems of more than one human being. And that is the problem of uh, comparison uh, of ego. The, the problem of ego is the one that creates. In fact, the, you will discover that, uh, I think later on it will come in uh, the subject uh, Socratic theme, Know Thyself. I'll deal with it extensively. Your question and ego and how it functions and how uh, we think that these are the merits and they can be known out or not. That I can deal with it that way. Yes? Uh, does it require a certain amount of attention to go to one level? You have to gather it. When it's scattered, you will feel that when you try to pull it back, it's like strings tying you. If you are tied up to too many places, you have to clip them to withdraw to yourself. 
you don't have to go anywhere to go to a higher level of consciousness you don't have to go anywhere a lot of people say how do we go to a higher level of consciousness i tell them the simple method is not to go anywhere it's by going somewhere that we are not at the higher level we have to be back to ourselves that's the higher level and what is not letting us come back to ourselves are the scattering of attention to different places once we cut off these and uh, these various strands which are tying us down to various attachments then we can withdraw that is necessary yes uh, about a year ago when a psychic told me that in my search for turning within that i was my biggest problem because i stand in my own way and i found it hard to really again i realized that this is a problem of intellect and intellect cannot understand that problem of intellect that's true that's what i've been talking all evening you know that is that is <laughs> that what they mean by standing in your own way exactly it's been real hard for me to to try i've been rolling that around in my head for almost no you can't do it your when you say it's been very hard for me to try and understand that naturally it's hard because you're trying to understand the same intellect which is standing in the way have you tried understanding it any other way other than intellect no therefore the answer is to find some other way not the intellect intellect stands in our way and intellect cannot be a solution to finding a way how to get rid of it because we are enforcing it some people say i tried very hard on the spiritual path I said then then you never got anything I'm sure so how do you know because you tried very hard you put yourself your mind so much into it that you the very wall you were trying to demolish you were building up at the same time you have to go over to intuition love that means you have to jump into an area where you are not accustomed to you are not used these faculties that is why it necessary we we are a complete believer in the in the philosophy that uh, you need a master a guru a teacher a guide who has raised his level to higher awareness before you can get rid of intellect for the simple reason that any other way of trying to understand the problem uses intellect people say we why well, we can read a book and do it is written by the same masters if a master speaks to us how is it different from the book the difference is that the book says what your mind says the book means different thing depending on your mind you know on different days the book is nothing but your mind interpreting what is there you are reading your mind not the book when the master is there living in front of you he tells you mind says no no he says yes <laughs> show me that's not your mind somebody says no 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 there are lot of people who got all the knowledge from a bird flying a bird was going over the river and suddenly by inspiration they discovered it when you try to understand bird talk it is all your mind talk some people say no with your own ideas you can develop it what are ideas your mind once you realize that the problem area is your mind you cannot use the mind to solve it and what else is there other than your mind except a teacher who will not let you go with your mind there's no other way and a teacher can be no other except another human being who does not talk the language of our mind any other teacher even god himself cannot communicate with us because we communicate with our mind Ah, God said this to me last night. A lot of people tell me, and I tell them, "Are you sure your mind didn't tell that? Tell me the distinction." There's no distinction. In fact, I can tell them for certainty your mind said this to you, not God. Let them listen to somebody who's not their mind. They will know what God tells them. That is why, if you want to break the barrier of the intellect, it is necessary to find a teacher who has raised his level of awareness above yours. functions without the use of the mind uses these capacities of love and intuition and communicates with us through those faculties it takes us out of our own minds that is the minimum that you expect i always have a form in a way um i just couldn't get the word but uh, when you put yourself down that's the, there's another word that them those use but uh, what deprecate yes whatever but uh <laughs> it really impedes one from uh, in other words when i mention different levels whatever level you happen to be at it's possibly the greatest moment for your consciousness so that uh, you really can't make that progress unless you get that inner help like you mentioned so that where you uh, so you shouldn't feel bad or sad 
that you're uh, being picked on, although I have, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was necessary, but I just say that. That's a, just a point in, uh, in meditating and so forth. You shouldn't uh, worry too much about what happens from moment to moment because it, it can stop you from it. I t go further and say you should never worry. Not, yeah. in, med well, not in meditation, beginning. never. You need not worry. Worry has never solved it. No, but you can't. You don't know where you're at, really. And it's up to him to place you where you are. It's beneficial if you go up or down or what. So that's it. Yes. Is it true that some people that worry, however, have imperfections in their, let's say, a person that sits on his hands all day and he wonders why he can't get any work done. He says, how can I get some work done? Isn't it a truth that he has to make some efforts and, and let's say, get a certain understanding that you have to get off your hands uh, and do a certain thing? Uh, but aren't there more subtle things that bring up these worries in some minds? There are things that they must do. It's not just the fact that they, they can't worry because that could be suicidal, mm -hmm. couldn't it? Yeah, when I said you should not worry, I know that everybody will still worry. I'm worry sure of that. Worrying. I'm sure of that. When I said that, I was sure of that. Therefore, what makes us worry is not a simple fact that we have decided to, get, uh, to worry. It's not that simple. There are, uh, there are a lot of factors which uh, are responsible for make, making us worry. There are a lot of factors which make us feel that we have to put in an effort. There are a lot of factors which make us feel that we have to try hard and do all those things. But when you discover the truth at higher levels of consciousness, then you find that all those factors were induced by a pattern. And the fact that you feel, I must make an effort, is also an induced feeling. And it comes from a, a higher level of consciousness, where you are being helped. Where you are being helped. Some people have asked me this question. In spiritual growth and uh, progress, is grace more important than effort? Straight question. Is it all his grace or is our effort? And which is more important? And I have always turned around and said, what is the difference? Will you ever make effort without his grace? Why does the thought come? Let's make effort. That is the grace. If somebody thinks grace means this wall will break up and something will come, it never happens. The grace is that you want to do something. What looks like your effort at this level of consciousness is discovered to be happening entirely because of him when you go to higher level of consciousness. What looks like your effort here becomes entirely his grace at the higher level. It's the same thing. It is grace that you think you are making an effort. So there is no real difference. Difference is because of the two levels of consciousness. Yes? There is a certain degree of helplessness I think one feels in rising above the mind at times. Um, it's similar to the story you related about the dog entering the room and you beat it out holding the tail, you know. And therefore I think the need for prayer and longing to rise above it I think is a sustaining part of human growth. Quite right. Is that right? Quite right. Well, thank you very much.